For the first time ever, a West Side Story movie has more than one Puerto Rican in the cast. Here's everything else we loved about Steven Spielberg's West Side Story. The Upper West Side of Manhattan was in a state of flux back in the late 50s and early 60s. Thanks to the so-called urban renewal programs initiated by Robert Moses, who sought to beautify New York City, many poor communities were torn down with residents displaced. The slums of the Upper West Side were high in crime and a haven for youth gangs, hence why it was chosen as a setting for West Side Story in the first place. Today, after decades of gentrification and the building of Lincoln Center, the Upper West Side is a neighborhood for New York's most wealthy denizens, while its former residents and their descendants found themselves driven north to Harlem, Washington Heights, the Bronx, and parts of Westchester. In the new West Side Story, the looming gentrification hangs over the neighborhood, adding an extra layer of tragedy to the story. Since the gangs are fighting over turf, but that turf is about to be demolished by the government, then they fight only for the sake of their own hate. The very first scene features a sign advertising the construction of Lincoln Center, and numerous other scenes allude to the urban renewal that will change the neighborhood forever. You know, I wake up to everything I know either getting sold or wrecked or being taken over by people that I don't like. While the 1961 film is still a beloved classic, it nevertheless has some elements that don't quite hold up in 2021. Most notably, the Puerto Rican characters are played almost exclusively by white actors in dark makeup. Are there any questions? Yes, sir. Would you mind translating that into Spanish? The sole Puerto Rican in the cast, Rita Moreno, had to wear brown face makeup to match her darkened co-stars. For the remake, the production enlisted the help of actual Latinos to play the Puerto Rican roles. Maria is played by Rachel Zegler, who is half Colombian, while Bernardo's actor David Alvarez is Cuban-Canadian, and Ariana DeBose, who plays Anita, is Afro-Puerto Rican. Also noteworthy is the amount of unsubtitled Spanish dialogue in the film, the meaning of which can be gleaned through context. This reinforces the notion that West Side Story isn't a Latino-American story or a white American story, it's both. The Jets are a gang of white boys from the street, which includes the character Anybody's. Their characterization varies depending on the production and is thus open to interpretation, but most versions are easy to interpret as transgender characters. In the 1961 film, Anybody's, played by Susan Oakes, is constantly dismissed by Riff and the Jets for being a girl. After some persistence, they're eventually accepted by Ice, the de facto leader of the Jets. Hey! You done good, buddy boy. Thanks. In the new film, Anybody's is played by Iris Minas, a non-binary actor. They initially appear as something of a tag-along character who follows the Jets more than they actually interact with them. Eventually, Anybody's gets locked up along with the other Jets and is placed in the women's side of the holding room, with the more overtly male Jets on their own bench. When the Jets hassle Anybody's over their gender, calling them a girl, Anybody shouts, I ain't no girl, and pounces on the other gang members, throwing punches that catch everyone off guard, even the cops. Overall, Anybody's has always been a revolutionary character for trans theater enthusiasts, and this new iteration reinforces that notion without derailing the film from its main story. Anybody's is who they are, and that's that. If you've got a problem with that, be ready for a fight. Tony and Maria first meet at a dance attended by both gangs. Initially, the dance is willfully segregated, with each gang dancing with their dates on the respective side of the gymnasium. Even when the MC tries to get the dancers to intermingle, it doesn't take, and the dance nearly breaks down into a brawl. The song Dance at the Gym is played with a near-manic energy beyond that of the original movie, and the new dancing has extra energy to match. Spielberg treats the dancers with the same respect and dedication as the stuntmen in any Indiana Jones movie, drawing attention to their incredible talent with long takes and sharp camera movements that heighten the dancing just like the best of his action-adventure films. When Maria and Tony notice each other and make an instant love connection, the production design kicks into overdrive, with the lighting changing to reflect how the world simply looks different when you're in love. This sense of romantic whimsy underscores most of Tony and Maria's scenes, and elevates West Side's story beyond a mere remake of its source material, but a brand new interpretation of a timeless love story. One of the biggest changes in the film for the 1961 version is the path of the gun that's ultimately used to kill Tony. In the 1961 movie, Chino just kind of has the revolver, and it doesn't appear on screen until he uses it in the last several minutes of the story. Here, the gun is purchased by Riff and the Jets to make sure they have their bases covered in case the sharks bring a gun. The shopkeeper from whom they purchased the gun draws a parallel between their gun and the omnipresent danger, especially in 1957, of nuclear annihilation. Riff thinks he's buying a deterrent, but the seller makes reference to mutually assured destruction. Deterrence is the idea that if both sides build up enough of an armory, each side might be too intimidated to escalate violence against each other, or they might destroy each other completely. Do you want to start World War III? 
During the rumble, Riff gives Tony the gun just in case, but it's discarded during the battle. While the gang members flee from the carnage they unleashed, Chino sees the six-shooter lying on the ground and picks it up, setting the stage for the film's final tragic showdown. In all versions of West Side Story, the rumble ends the same way, with Bernardo and Riff dead on the floor after Tony tries in vain to prevent the fighting. This time around, there are some twists to the proceedings, with Tony slicing off a bigger piece of the action than before. Usually, the climactic fight between Riff and Bernardo kicks off when the latter insults and hits Tony, who is only trying to stop the fighting. This time, Tony doesn't stick to his pacifist intentions, and when Bernardo goads him, he puts up his dukes and engages the shark in one-on-one -on -one combat. Tony wins the fight, and the victory is all the more impressive since this version of Bernardo is a trained boxer. However, before delivering the finishing blow on a subdued Bernardo, Tony is reminded of the boy he beat nearly to death and how he might do the same, or worse, to Bernardo. Afterwards, he stops the fight. Unfortunately, this leaves an enraged Bernardo to whip out a switchblade and rush the former Jet leader with a renewed vigor, at which point Riff steps in with a blade of his own. From here, things play out as expected, with Bernardo accidentally killing Riff and Tony killing Bernardo in retaliation. After the rumble, Maria is shown working at the Gimbel's department store eager to see Tony again, especially because she naively believes he was able to defuse the tensions between the two gangs. She doesn't know that he failed and killed her brother Bernardo. In her unwitting ignorance, she breaks into song and sings I Feel Pretty, a beautiful solo number about being young and in love with the rest of the world just melting away. In the 1961 movie, the song is moved up in the story, placed before the rumble. It's likely the decision was made either to keep the tone from getting too light so soon after the rumble, or to spare Maria from Destiny's cruel joke. But with the new movie restoring I Feel Pretty to its place from the original show, it adds an extra layer of bittersweet tragedy to the song. Maria's life has been changed forever, and it's about to get even worse, but she doesn't know it yet. This way, when she finds out the truth from Chino, the revelation is even more heartbreaking. Rita Moreno, who played Anita in the 1961 movie, returns for the remake, this time playing a new character, Valentina. She's the wife of Doc, the owner of the drugstore where Tony works, and effectively takes his place in the narrative. As a Puerto Rican woman married to a white man, she has a unique perspective on the events that unfold, and she sees the budding love between Tony and Maria as something that, while fraught with danger, could bring peace to the dueling gangs. When she learns of the deadly rumble, Valentina is devastated. She knows firsthand the potential of love, but she also knows that hate can be such an overwhelming force. As she looks at pictures of herself and her husband, Doc, she breaks into Somewhere, one of the most beautiful songs from the musical. The song laments the hatred and violence that surrounds Tony and Maria, but with Valentina singing it, it becomes an anthem for interracial love. Valentina and Doc surely have their own West Side Story, and they were lucky enough to make it through with their lives and their love intact. Tony and Maria would not have the same good fortune. Chino is something of a non-entity in previous versions of West Side Story. He's in something of an arranged marriage to Maria, but she's not interested in him romantically, though she has no personal grudge against him. He's the one who tells Maria that Tony killed Bernardo, and then shows up again at the end to shoot Tony. He's more of a plot device than an actual character. The new movie gives purpose to Chino, with more care and attention paid to his characterization and motives. After the rumble, Chino picks up Riff's gun and runs off alongside the rest of the sharks. He is the focal point of a new scene where he laments the death of Bernardo, his best friend. While the other sharks wish for a full-scale war against the Jets, Chino decries their selfish pride and calls his dead friend a fool who allowed his own pride to drag him into an early grave. Nevertheless, he sets out to avenge his fallen friend, knowing full well such an act will cost him his soul and his freedom. After Maria and Anita reconcile, or at least reach an understanding, Anita goes to Doc and Valentina's drugstore to tell Tony to wait for Maria to arrive so they can run away together. But when Anita arrives, she is accosted by the Jets, who have become an angry, ravenous mob of young monsters. Valentina rescues her and shames the Jets into disbanding, but the damage is already done, and Anita calls Valentina a race traitor before lying and saying that Chino has killed Maria. When Valentina tells Tony, he loses control and runs into the night, begging for Chino to finish him too. Chino then shoots Tony as Maria helplessly watches. After Tony dies in Maria's arms, Maria snatches the gun from Chino's hands and threatens to shoot him, the Jets, the Sharks, and herself, saying, I can kill too because now I have hate. It's a brutal declaration, and Rachel Zegler's intensity matches that of Natalie Wood from the original film. Moved by her words and finally understanding the consequences of their actions, members of both gangs respectfully carry Tony's body away while the cops arrive to arrest Chino. Suffice to say, it's not a happy ending, and Maria's survival deprives West Side Story of the conclusiveness of Romeo and Juliet, since the Jets and Sharks must now live forever with the knowledge that their petty hatred destroyed a love that had the potential to be more powerful than any street gang.
check out one of our newest videos right here. Plus, even more Looper videos about your favorite movies and TV shows are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.